Okay, let's um, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> this is always a good place. Um, okay. <laughs> who are you, and what is Aperion? Aperion. I'm not. There's a multiple ways you could possibly pronounce this. And why would someone need to use your service? Sure. Hi, uh, Mark Lorian here, uh, President and General Manager of Aperion. Um, uh, we have been a company providing mobile application management and security software. Um, we were founded in 2009, uh, and the company was acquired by Arxan, which is a large security provider uh, based in San Francisco. That acquisition took place uh, and was announced last January. So now Aperion operates as an autonomous business unit of Arxan. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Aperion business is headquartered in Boston. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got people spread globally. Um, the product itself helps enterprises to securely distribute mobile apps that are destined for workers. So the kinds of apps that companies uh, don't want in the public app stores. So we have a, a mechanism for onboarding, securing, and deploying applications to uh, full-time workers, part-time workers, contracted workers, dealers, other people through a uh, business relationship with an organization, and I'm guessing I'm guessing you support. I'll put in quote marks all because there's really only two um, major phone platforms as well. We do. Yep we 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 run on all of the major platforms, uh, including Windows devices as well. Uh, yep. Although the the usage we haven't seen um, that significant at this point. We expect that growth rate will continue. But yes, all major platforms, um, native uh, mobile applications, uh, web or hybrid-based uh, applications as well, and that that allows companies to take um, web-based applications they may have developed and and made available internally, and we sort of help turn those into hybrid applications that run in a native container on the mobile device, improving user experience a bit and allowing the organization to apply policies to how the apps are run. Let's actually dig into that a little bit. So with a web application, um, are you talking about applications made in a hybrid way and then packaged as applications using something like um, PhoneGap or Cordova, or are you talking about actual web pages as well? Um, we can do either. Um, the technology effectively runs the web application or the web page or website inside a native browser. Mm-hmm. So we have a technology that basically runs the application in the browser. There's policy controls around the native browser that control and pass um, you know, uh, login or identity information to the application and control you know how the how the browser app itself is going to be run, um, and if the app itself is developed in a responsive way, then the then the user experience is that much better inside the browser. So, um, you know, typically what we see is that enterprises will build um, mobile friendly applications um, running in web browsers, and then we'll render those in a nice and intelligent way in the mobile device. So it allows the IT organization to extend many of their applications more quickly. Um, but, you know, um, having said that, in the larger deployments for, you know, really um, largely deployed applications, we're still seeing um, those heavily developed as native applications because the experience is still just that much better. And looking at some screenshots here for the product, I mean, it basically looks a bit like the kind of application native app store. Um, and so... So it's an experience that people are mostly used to. Um, but how, how exactly, first question is, how does this work? How, do you sit between the official app stores and then let administrators kind of filter in and out the, the applications they want um, staff to be able to access and then also updates to those as well? So they could even you know, not allow uh, users to have an update if there's a change to the application that breaks an internal process or something like that. Is is that how you work? You sort of sit in front of the official app stores? Um, well, in uh, actually, it's more simply put that we replace the app store, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the public app store. So there's, there's a couple of main components to our offering. Um, one, there is a mobile app management lifecycle manager.
manager. It's basically a back end service that is um, that's run by an organization's administrators. Um, they can use our interface into the administration console. The whole platform is also um, reachable via API. So if an organization wants to build and you know initiate calls against our API, they can leverage the same functionality. But the the scope of that uh, map management workflow manager allows the company to onboard inspect and and uh, secure the applications and then make them available um, via second component a brandable app store so there's an interface that the company will completely rebrand i don't know what screenshot you're looking at but um, we have some generic ones that sort of showcase the degree of, of brandability but really no two app stores look the same it has the company's branding they have complete control over the layout and the look and the feel um, they do tend to mimic very closely uh, the flow and the experience in public app stores. And that's because with the familiar experience, it drives higher levels of adoption because you don't have to train people on how to navigate to find their company apps. Um, and then the third major component is a policy engine, which runs in between the workflow manager and the, and the, um, and the front end, which basically governs the kinds of security and usage policies applied to each of the applications. So administrators can kind of go down a checklist and say, I want these apps to have these kinds of policies and these policies will be applied to these apps over here. And you can you can pick and choose depending on the, the content, the functionality, the data, the backend access that each of the applications has. But, you know, to end users in a company, a worker, you know, their exposure to the Appearium platform is is largely through a corporate branded um, app store that's powered by our technology. I kind of, I mean, maybe it's just the screenshot I'm looking at, but so for example, in this there's Dropbox. So maybe mm-hmm. forgive my uh, um, lack of knowledge on using apps in an enterprise environment, but how does Dropbox get there then? It, do they Does Dropbox have its own kind of enterprise version that they allow for distribution through third-party stores or is there something else happening there? I understand how yeah. like internal specialized applications will work, but something like that that's sort of broader use as well. Yeah, no, good question. So on, on with regard to public apps or public brands like a Dropbox, um, there's, a, there's a couple of options. Uh, one is the organization can, quote, curate a list of recommended and publicly available apps. So a company might say, you know, of the file and cloud storage applications, we suggest Dropbox because we did our research and we think this is going to work best. And the, 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 the quote, app in the appearing app store is effectively a link over to the version of Dropbox uh, or to the, you know, to, uh, to Dropbox in the public app store where the app is downloaded and then via corporate credentials and, um, uh, you know, volume purchasing programs, then the user can log into and get a, you know, a key to the particular um, uh, license for Dropbox. That's one, that's one option. The other option is some of the large, or not even large, but some of the application providers out there also will sell and license a uh, private version of an application. And that's really up to our customers to negotiate with the application provider. So in the Dropbox example, an organization could go to Dropbox and say, we would like our own, you know, private version of Dropbox, and they would get an unsigned version of the application binary, stick it into the Appearian platform, sign it with their enterprise credentials, and make that application available for download. Um, some application providers do that. Some do it for some enterprise customers and not others. So it really depends on the specific case. But our platform would support either linking out and facilitating the download of a publicly available application or the download of an ISV application where the company has a license to resign and distribute. Okay. I am just, I kind of would see how that'd be possible with um, Android, but I just sort of thinking how you do that with iOS, but uh, I guess that's uh, <laughs> a more complicated discussion. It's usually a fair well, it, down it, platform. It, it, yeah, it's it. That's true. Um, it really comes down to the licensing that's in place with the with the provider, and, and we're using Dropbox because it's a recognizable mm-hmm. name. But when you start looking inside particular vertical industries where you have 
you know, ISVs that have specialized applications, um, in those cases, we see a higher likelihood that the application provider is going to make their app available for, um, in a, in a, in a private way. It allows the company to have a, um, a slightly rebranded version of the application. They might have a different, um, icon representing the application that sort of says, you know, for example, uh, health, um, you know, regional health provider XYZ, uh, patient check-in application, right? That kind of application and it has the name of the health organization on the app icon. It may be as simple as that, and then it allows the health regional health organization to to re-sign with their enterprise credentials. So it's a, more of a specialized application um, that clearly is destined for workers and the kind of thing that, you know, those kinds of uh, enterprises aren't going to want to be directing their end users um, to a public app store to download. Plus, it would be confusing because you'd see so many versions of that application sitting in the public app store. So technically, it's really not that difficult. It comes down to the vendor's, you know, business model and their their eagerness and willingness to make, um, you know, resignable versions of their application sure. available. But we do see it. Yeah. And I'd imagine a lot of them would because it's where they make most of their income, really. <laughs> Not yeah. From people, yeah. It, individuals, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's more of a B two B, you know, application provider, and it's it's more of a bespoke application where a very tiny amount of the application is changing, company to company. It could be as simple as the as the icon, as I mentioned, or the application name, or the app may come sort of pre-populated with the particular organization's information. Mm. So, and how, can you handle things like um, removing default applications on either platform or? Yeah, especially with Android. I mean, it depends very much on the manufacturer. But, like, you know, there's applications installed on my phone that I can't even get rid of. <laughs> I'd like to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do no you kidding. somehow find a way around well, those as well? Or? Well, one of, one of the things that differentiates our approach is that we do everything that we do without requiring device enrollment. Um, so we, we work side-by-side side with MDM-based systems. That's mobile device management systems. Okay. Um, and we're one of the only technology providers uh, or enterprise solution providers that can do that. Um, so it allows us to, as an example, distribute securely an application to an unmanaged device. And where that's especially important is if you have BYOD uh, scenarios or scenarios where you're trying to get an application onto the device of a worker who's not an employee. Mm. So a contracted mm. worker, a consultant, uh, a dealer, a franchisee, a temporary worker, individuals like that. And it's a particularly tricky thing to do because the majority of enterprise uh, mobility management products out there, they do what they do because they have control over the device and they can force install and they can control things at the, at a, at the operating system mm. level, mm. including... Uh, once the device is m- under management by an IT organization, they could affect the applications that are running on it. However, in the scenario where you've got a BYOD worker uh, or a worker that's not an employee, you often can't run an MDM-based system. Um, so in those scenarios, you, you really don't have the option to use an MDM-based system and therefore... Um, and therefore, you would leverage a, a solution such as Appearian. But what it means, back to your original question, is there are some things that we cannot do that would be more common in an MDM-based system because of uh, the device enrollment. So we don't require device enrollment. We can securely distribute an application, but we're not able to do some MDM-centric things like um, – uh, you know, sort of, you know, mandate the installation of an application or, you know, remove base applications on a particular device. Um, but the upside is that we become a very flexible deployment mechanism when you've got a, a really distributed uh, workforce. Mm. Well, let's have a look at some of the other features you also have. Um, interestingly, I like uh, enabling an, an app for a particular amount of time and then disabling it. Um, I could think yeah. of some use cases for that. Um, also, just if, especially for contractors, I guess, promos and, yes. and uh, things like that. Yep. Uh, wiping data, yeah. uh, a VPN, um, and also jailbreak and root protection, which yeah. actually, especially coupled with 
uh, the VPN and also your data at rest encryption, I guess, is a important features as well for not just making sure people are using the apps that you want them to, but um, that what they do with them is safe from various prying eyes. Exactly, exactly. If you, you know, a very a common use setting is deploying an application to an unmanaged device. That mm. is essentially why the majority of customers come to us. They have, they have a workforce that's using unmanaged devices, either because the user doesn't want MDM on the device or they can't, mm. right? In the case of a contracted worker or even a physician that often may be, you know, visiting multiple hospital systems, they can't run more than one MDM based system on their phone. So, um, so because of that, we need to offer our customers a rich set of policies that allow them to have, you know, granular control at the application level um, without requiring MDM. So we try to do as much as we can, um, sort of mimicking what's available in an MDM based system, but without using MDM. So, you know, for example, in a contracted worker or a temp worker or BYOD worker scenario, you want the ability to remove sensitive data if the worker ceases to become a worker, you know, whether they're terminated, whether their project ends or they move on. So we have a variety of policy controls that give the administrator the ability to effectively wipe out and render that application useless when the, their employment is terminated. Now, an MDM-based system um, can, you know, can do that um, because the device itself is is under management. At the same time, an MDM-based system could also wipe out personal applications without the worker, mm. you know, knowing or approving. Um, in our case, we give control over the worker, you know, the workforce applications themselves. So if it's a, you know, if it's an app that the company purchased or built, um, the administrator can can you know eliminate access, remove and wipe the data. We can ensure that the right people are using the application um, in a secure setting. Uh, sorry, in, in a secure way, in a distributed, unmanaged setting. So we've got um, we've got several dozen uh, policies that can be applied, and there you are naming some of them that can be applied in various combinations. Um, we also have the ability to create custom policies for organizations. So um, those not all administrators would see because they may be specific to a particular uh, customer. Um, but the policy engine itself is extensible, so we have the ability to to develop um, app centric uh, policies that can be applied as needed. Actually, this is a, a sort of bridging question to a question I wanted to ask you. When it comes to the policies, can you actually um, get quite fine grained with that? So, for example, it might be um, you allow an app, say, say it's some sort of e commerce application. I'm not, I don't know, for purchasing hotels or something on the road. And mm-hmm. you allow access to that application, but to only allow payment through credit cards and not Apple Pay, for example. I don't know. I'm not sure if that even makes sense. But can you get to the kind of permission level um, policies for each application? Um, yeah, we can get pretty pretty specific. I don't. I mean, that particular. I'm not the right person to yeah. answer that question. Um, um, but I'll say generally the level of specificity uh, never ceases to amaze me. I mm-hmm. think the, you know, the idea is we've got some some pretty interesting policies that are have been deployed for specific customers where they're coming with, you know, four or five different kind of variables that they they want to let the application run or they want to limit the application's functionality depending on you know four or five conditions that are checked and you can imagine the policy engine uh, that gets applied to the applications kind of going through a series of logical checks. Mm. So, you know, if this and that and not that, then allow the app to run in this way. That's kind of the, the conceptual way that it, that it runs. And the, you know, the policy engine can, can be looking at different variables that exist. They can, you know, prompt the user for some kind of activity or behavior and, um, you know, other environmental settings and you can combine some of the existing policies that we have with custom logic as well. So you might say, well, you know, if this user is in this um, user category or, or um, user group and the device is jailbroken, then 
allow this behavior. If they're in this user group and the device is jailbroken, then don't allow this behavior. Mm. Um, as a very basic example, but you, you're sort of doing a, a series of checks um, and then affecting the way that the app is going to behave. I was, I was going to say in doing all of that without the device itself being managed, I think that mm. when I talk to customers, I think what m many find most remarkable is the level of control that our platform can apply to individual applications without the device using MDM mm. and, you know, and giving administrators a very fine degree of control over who's using work, you know, workforce applications and how um, without the device itself being under control with MDM and, and users like that because, you know, and the MDM based approach uh, is often not appreciated by users who are worried about, you know, quote, big brother uh, looking at their photos or looking at the kinds of applications that might be installed on a phone, even even without looking at somebody's uh, inside an application, the fact that they may have, for example, a a weight loss application or a dating application on their on their phone, the, the mere presence that those applications exist, many people find, uh, intrusive into their personal life. So I think because of that, MDM-based systems have have struggled with reaching the kind of adoption that many enterprises want with their applications. So we be, we provide a viable alternative to that, um, you know, without enforcing device enrollment. And one other interesting feature I, I find, although these looks like these are optional features, the inspection reports you have for each application, where you can, I mean, I've seen these. This sort of functionality in web applications a lot uh, and modules for web applications that can be more easily scanned but you actually uh, dig into the application itself and find the the, the frameworks it uses uh, and some of the third-party tools it uses and then give it a, a sort of trustable score um, which mm -hmm. I find interesting and do you have any insights into how you do that because uh, I sort of almost find that interesting separate from everything else <laughs> in some respects. Uh, no, it is. Yeah. Well, in fact, it's a whole, there's a whole market. Uh, the category is often called app scanning. Um, so what, so we don't offer that natively. What mm. we do do is integrate with a variety of the top app scanning solutions. Uh, okay. So, Many companies uh, already have a relationship with an app scanning uh, vendor, particularly companies that are developing a lot of apps. Um, so we integrate and make that a seamless part of the app lifecycle. So, for example, when an application is uploaded into our platform, we integrate with the organization's chosen app scanning vendor, automatically run the report, scan the application for vulnerabilities or risks, Present the report findings and the and the um, and the scan score so that the administrator can make a better decision about the policies that should be applied to the application, or frankly, whether or not they want to permit the application to move out into production anyway. Um, you know, it's a typical setting for a deployment like ours. Might be that you've got a centralized mobility center of excellence. Um, they've centralized the onboarding and the distribution of applications throughout the organization. However, many different divisions or groups of, uh, of workers are developing or purchasing applications for deployment. But because this is all centralized, the central group can, can take application requests from, you know, dozens of business units, hundreds or thousands of workers centralize the onboarding, but this gives them, from a governance perspective, a very consistent way of onboarding applications, inspecting them for potential malware or adverse behavior, you know, looking at the risk score, having a, a sort of a standardized way of determining which applications are going to get deployed and which policies are going to be deployed, are going to be applied to each individual application. And it's a way, again, from a governance perspective, of separating um, security from app functionality and the centralized group can apply a very consistent set of policies to applications based on their onboarding state. And one of the other features, I think anyone who's come from sort of public, uh, special, um, especially iOS application development would know is this process of signing. It's not so fraught yeah. in Android, but it's especially painful in iOS. 
Um, yes. But anyone who's done a public app development will not realize maybe that in, in, in the sort of walled garden of an enterprise application, you can offer the ability to make that a lot easier. Um, and there's an internal, you have an internal signing process for we do. internal applications. And actually, I think it's worth pointing out to any sort of application developers, this whole uh, area of enterprise application development anyway is a very different process and, and quite lucrative work for any developer. Uh, and things like yeah. this also make it uh, easier. You know, you don't have to worry about the whims of Google and Apple. You can just work more closely with a smaller, maybe, <laughs> client. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and get much tighter user base and tighter development workflow. And this is another aspect of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, there's a, a very uh, large and healthy growing population of, of people, of developers who are specializing in the development of an enterprise app. Um, you know, developing an app for the workforce or business worker requires the same kinds of skills uh, that are required when developing a consumer app, like, because, you know, at the end of the day, workers are still consumers in their personal time and they have expectations in terms of, the usability of an application, you know, how, how quickly they become productive, how compelling and interesting and sticky the experience is, even if the application is connecting to backend data. Um, you know, the added complexity of developing enterprise apps and having to integrate with some enterprise systems, I think, also draws many developers because it's, it's sort of rich, intellectually challenging, technically challenging work. Um, the notion of signing, um, you know, does fall on the developer often, but in an enterprise, the signing of an application may be separated from the developer of the application itself. So, you know, technically an enterprise developer could sign the app. But again, if you think about an enterprise and, you know, imagine an organization that's got, you know, multiple divisions and, and groups perhaps scattered all over the world. Maybe there are tens of thousands of users in the, um, in the user base and you've got dozens or maybe even hundreds of applications. In that kind of scenario, it's very common that the organization would centralize um, some element of app management. They use a platform like ours, and they also, to your signing point, centralize the signing of the application, which is a remarkably cumbersome process, um, you know, in that you generally have all of, the, of an organization's apps signed by one signing credential. Mm. So, the, the signing engine that we built into our platform helps centrally manage that and it tracks the dates when, when signing certificates need to be, you know, when apps need to be re-signed, which happens, you know, at least once a year. If there are no, you know, at a minimum once a year, they need to be re-signed. And every time an app is rebuilt, you have a new version, they need to be re-signed. So you can be dealing with a, a really remarkable combination or even permutation of signing situations that need to be managed. I mean, that we have some customers that buy our platform just to manage the signing management mm -hmm. of enterprise applications. And kind of on the uh, the final sort of set of features here um, is analytics. Um, I'm interested because I can see in kind of a screenshot it details things like users, downloads, usage rate, things like that. But can you take it any deeper and maybe integrate into external analytics services to then also have access to analytics on more detailed usage uh, as well? Or is it just those kind of top-level figures at the moment? Well, what, what we have done is try to deliver the kind of analytics that you can't get from uh, you know, in-app analytic solutions. So, you know, many developers will use a third-party uh, analytic service mm. inside the application. So, you know, do users click this button more than this button? Mm. Um, do they follow this navigation path more frequently than this navigation path? We don't try to replicate those. Okay. The, added, the added analysis that our platform does do is things like what is our penetration rate for the total population of targeted users, right? That is something that in-app analytics cannot do because they have no notion of the population of people who should be using the application. So take, for example, um, I don't know, a Salesforce 
enablement app. Maybe a big pharmaceutical company has got a uh, an app that is presenting information about a particular pharmaceutical product and you know the um, and the implications of using it. And they know that 10,000 people um, should be, you know, 10,000 sales reps in the field should be using this application. Um, and when you look at actual usage data, you can determine, for example, you know, of these 10,000 um, would be and should be users, only 2,500 are using. And of the 2,500 people who have downloaded and installed this application, only 650 are actually using it. And of the 650 who are using it, only 250 have used it in the last um, 48 hours, mm -hmm. right? And and now you and then and and only the people who are actually using the application, only those people um, would the in-app analytics be giving you insights about. But what our approach does is help augment that by saying, hey, you've got an adoption problem with a really expensive mm -hmm. app that should be developing, you know, it should be delivering. Uh, really remarkable value for the organization, but it's not. So mm -hmm. let's figure out what what aspects outside of the application might be affecting adoption, right? And then once you get the users inside the application, sure, the in-app analytics products become useful because then you can optimize things like button placement or nav paths. Mm -hmm. um, but beforehand, we really try to shine a bright light on on adoption challenges and helping companies get around that so they can actually drive usage into the applications that, you know, no big secret, they're really expensive to develop. Yeah. yeah. And I was just rounding up the, the feature set for us, some more general questions. I mean, strangely in your, your uh, sort of feature list, you save the getting started to, to the end, um, meaning that to even get people into this ecosystem in the first place, you support a lot of very common enterprise identity providers, although I don't see um, exchange listed here. Is there a reason for that? Am I misunderstanding something here? Could you authenticate uh, with exchange as well? Or yeah, yeah, we've got we have a variety of mechanisms for integrating with identity, and I don't. Oh, um, Active Directory. No, no, you know, I, I see think... it in the screenshot. Sorry, I see it in the screenshot. Yeah, now. yeah. Oh, yeah, ADFS. yeah. So Active Directory. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> very, right, Sorry. right. Yeah, well, you know, given that we are, uh, are are used to deploy inside the enterprise, it's very important that yeah. our customer base you know, knows who they're trying to deploy to. So we've got a lot of sort of uh, different options and configurations that are available for picking up identity and, and ensuring that the right people are using yeah. the right kinds of applications. So, you know, it's it's things like that. It's, it's things like integrating with common uh, development tools and build systems to make it easy to onboard applications. So we... Mm -hmm. You know, we really try to think about with the developer and the administrator in mind, how are we going to make it as easy as possible to, to you know, onboard as many applications as quickly and as safely as possible, bring them under management, apply policies at the app level so that we can securely distribute these to anybody who needs them without requiring MDM um, and drive high levels of adoption. And if we can do that, then we know we're delivering good value for our customer base. Yeah. So. Now, a question that kind of pops up to me as I look through some some things here is, I guess, how much – two two questions relating to the same sort of thing. How much catch-up do you have to do each time uh, Google or Apple releases a software update? And secondly, how often are features that you offer kind of – made less useful or taken away from you due to things they due to features they introduce themselves uh yeah uh great question it's um there's always a bit of work around um operating system updates um by the way the same holds true for mdm based systems mm -hmm. i mean anybody mm -hmm. developing anything any app or technology developed and deployed to mobile, anybody who's doing anything is subjected to the same kinds of um, yeah. whims of the operating system providers. I mean, we, like everybody, you know, get access to early builds. You know, we've got, we're active in the development community, so we're keeping update, updated with, with things that are planned and in flight, and we're sort of constantly testing. Um, you know, as is often the case, there's some late minute, uh, changes before these, uh, the you know the OSs go to gold, and there's a little bit of scrambling that happens 
you know, as is the case with everybody. But it, I, you know, knock on wood, we've been we've been pretty stable for a long time. I can think of just a couple of features over the last five years that we lost because of things changed on the operating system. Um, and that's it. I mean, for the most part, I think we, you know, our engineers understand the operating system, um, operating systems really, really well. Um, the way that we, you know, hook into applications, we understand the, you know, the various hook points and we, when we're making, you know, architectural decisions, we, we try to do things in the most stable way and we stay up to date and, and try to, you know, soak it up so our customers don't have to deal um, with, you know, with some things. So in some cases, our platform insulates our customers from yeah. from some of the <laughs> complexities. And that's another value proposition. Um, so, yeah, it's a good point. Actually, I was thinking about that. I mean, how much do you isolate people, though? Do you isolate them just from features? Or do you also, you know, could someone be running uh, iOS 10, but it looking like iOS 8 still, you know, <laughs> how much? Well, how no, much not, you, yeah, not, yeah. not usually. I mean, I think, um, you know, in some cases we are leveraging, um, features of the operating system that are deprecated too. Mm. Um, and in that way, you know, one of the things that we'll do is, you know, it's, uh, you know, we will communicate actively with the customer base saying, Hey, you know, this, this feature is being deprecated from the operating system. And, you know, you've got X amount of time in order okay. to get those yeah. out of the yeah. application. Yeah. Um, so in, in a way, acting in, in some cases like an advisor yeah. uh, to the enterprise, you know, because, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of capabilities that the mobile operating systems support. Mm. Um, not all of them are relevant to every application. There may yeah, be new features sure. added or features deprecated that have no implication whatsoever on the particular app that you're building. Some of them may be more particular to consumer kinds of applications. For example, Apple Pay. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see a lot of that being used in enterprise applications. So, you know, a lot of our customers may not care about that so much. Whereas, you know, the introduction of, um, uh, you know, the watch, you know, the watch kit, as an example, may seem on the surface like a really popular consumer feature, which it obviously it is, but you know, there's a surprising amount of interest with enterprise customers for having options that run their enterprise apps there too. Mm -hmm. So kind of acting like a little bit of an advisor to our customers for enterprise features in the operating systems is something else our customers turn to us for. Cool. All right. Well, we've taken quite a trip through a lot of uh, features and, and functionality that you offer, but is there anything, um, A, that, that have missed that you'd want to make sure people know about or anything new coming up soon that you want people to know about? Um, no, this has been great, Chris. You, had, you asked a lot of great questions. I think, I mean, the one thing that I would offer is uh, we do offer a free trial of the platform. It's, it's to a basic version and sort of a web-based catalog, but it'll give you a sense for the ability to sort of onboard, configure, and deploy an application. So if any of your, any of your, your readers and listeners um, want to try that, um, we'd encourage you to come to the site, sign up for a free trial, and, and give it a whirl.